Hello there, Tando book club lovers. We are so happy to have you join us as we talk to African female authors about their books and the stories behind them. As is our custom, we always begin every episode with a quote from a famous African that we believe captures the spirit and message of the author we'll be interviewing. Today's quote is from Wali Soyinka, the first African writer to win Nobel, the Nobel Prize in Literature, and it states, the greatest threat to freedom is the absence of criticism. This quote sums up what our guest today embodies. You'll be able to understand why I picked this quote a little bit later. Running her company called Chances Inc., Audrey is a marketer and now publisher by day and an author by night. She has written seven splendid books, Life Will Humble You, published in December 2019, followed by Chances, published in November 2020. And her third book is called Appearances or Not, which was released in May 2021. She has written a series of children's books titled Wana Mofu, The Mofus, and Ompofu. And we welcome her latest contemporary romance novel titled Guilt. She's a single parent to three amazing girls. Her objective in her writing is to entertain, inspire, and motivate through her contemporary romance stories. On labeling people, she does think it is a bit limiting, but since people are always evolving, she will at least gladly accept for now the titles of realist and believer. Audrey, welcome. Thank you very much, Selena. So Audrey, let's get stuck into the interview. Why did you start writing in the first place? Okay, um, my first book is titled Life Will Humble You. And as cliched as it sounds, life actually did humble me. So that book, it, it has 10% true facts of what happened to me. And then uh, while I was wallowing away in my pain and my anger, I started journaling because uh, our pastor at church would always say, you need to journal. So I started journaling my pain and then I thought, why not turn it into something positive, something to inspire someone out there. So that became the, the rest of my story in writing. Well, I think that's really powerful and I love the way that your personal story went beyond you. And I think that is the core of a writer's journey. Um, often in a journal, we write to ourselves, but when we write a novel or a book that's going to be published, we write for other people to read. And so there's a big difference between the two. And I think that's always the mark of a true writer and a true published writer. So well done to you and for taking the journey into so many other stories after life will humble you. Thank you very much. It's been a very inspiring journey, even for myself. Uh, I found a purpose, I found a voice, and now I'm using my voice. So I'm actually grateful. So you mentioned journaling, especially around the time of the first book. But now we're seven books later. You've gone into children's books. You've also gone into publishing. What does your writing process look like, especially to keep up with that level of productivity? Okay, so for me, uh, as I go through my life, uh, there are things that annoy me, things that irritate me, so I'll be writing them down. And then I'll just put it in a story, give the issues to my characters. So I'm, I'm questioning some of the things that as society we've accepted, some of the things even as religion that we've accepted. So I question all those things and I give the, the questions to my characters. And so for me, it's, it's that process and then a lot of research uh, into my characters' uh, professions and whatnot. I research a lot. And then also just listening to people as they go through life, you actually learn a lot. So that's my process. Okay, so out of that process, we've got Life Will Humble You, we've got Chances, we've got Appearances or Not. There's obviously also the trilogy that follows afterwards and most recently, Guilt. So how did these particular books and themes come about? And what's so special about Chances? Because that's also the name of your publishing company. Okay, um, I'm glad you actually asked that question. Chances is the book where uh, I just, you know, I, I let my imagination run away with me. I even set it in a foreign land, though I gave my characters obviously Shona names and whatnot. Mm -hmm. But I was just being myself. So you find even my payoff line for, for my company is embrace yourself. So I believe as a society, as a people, we don't allow people to be who they are. We tell them who to become, etc. So even in my stories, you find this sort of interlink. So you find in uh, appearances, I was talking about, you know, social classes. 
uh, why would you choose uh, to date someone from like the the, the main character mm. is from the Grange, mm. and the 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 man is from Glenora. So even in my blurb, I put the Grange meets Glenora. So I always throw in these things, the questions to people to say, yeah, if they like each other, let them be. And then with the children's series, uh, being a mother. Uh, the one time I was looking for books for my kids to read, mm -hmm. I found out we don't have any books mm -hmm. by Zimbabwean people in the bookshops. It's always uh, the Kenyans, uh, mm. the British, the Americans. So I thought, why not write stories by a Zimbabwe for Zimbabweans? You know, Shona names, uh, places that the children can relate to, Kariba, Vic Falls, ETC. So that's why I started writing that book. And it's a series, so I've written the book one, and I translated it into different languages so that we just encompass everyone in the country. So a book two will come, a book three will come, and the way I've made it, uh, her name is Rupone, so, sh so she'll be growing. When I wrote book one, she was in grade four, so maybe when she's grade seven, I'll write a book two, and then I'll follow up in high school, uni, and who knows, maybe even when she's married. That's a wonderful, and I love um, uh, charting a journey over a course of someone's lifetime so that children can grow up with their favorite characters. So there's always someone to turn to um, as they go through life seasons and um, big life experiences. So that's very wise of you. And it also hints to the fact that you definitely continue or aim to continue to write more. So we're very grateful for that because I don't think we have enough stories set in Zimbabwe that where people can reference um, things around them, their language, our unique and peculiar context and character. So I really, really think that that's important. Um, and you're doing it in a way that also puts it on a world stage so that other people can join us and begin to also understand us as a nation. So I really, really like that. Um, just before we go to break, I just want to find out, since the books have started making a name for themselves in the public space, what about people's responses has been a pleasant surprise for you? Well, that has actually been interesting. Um, for starters, there are people who didn't want to associate with me back then because of whatever I went through, you find that as a nation, like I keep on saying, we sort of label and stigmatize people. So you find that people now are interested in me, people want to be my friend, but on the whole, I've actually ministered to other people and this was my objective initially. I get responses, people saying, oh, this book made me cry, it ministered in my life, ETC, someone will say, oh, I found my Rico, he proposed. And guess what? It actually brings tears to my e to my eyes to, to think that this poor little Audrey is making a difference in people's lives. Well, I would say rich, powerful, strong um, Audrey, the enormity of what you possess and what you are carrying um, for the world and releasing to the world. Um, and many of us, I think, struggle to get out of our heads to be able to offer that to people. And I think you're doing it in a, in a way that's true to your personality and wise to you. So I think that there's a lot to just learn from your personal story behind these stories that you're sharing um, and how you've taken, I think, a very personal, many personal issues, but your observations and made them something that other people value. But we're going to take a short break now. So we'll be taking a short break and we'll be back in a few minutes to discuss Audrey Chirenge's books, particularly Life Will Humble You. Stay tuned. We're back with Audrey Chirenge discussing her book, Life Will Humble You. Audrey, Life Will Humble You is one of your first books. And in that book, you use two narrative points of view, mainly the protagonist and her love interest. But you're speaking in the first person using both genders, male and female. How did you manage to get into the mind of a male so that that voice would come through authentically? Okay, yeah, that's an interesting question. And just so you know, my publisher also had reservations about my writing style. He was like, in Zimbabwe, we don't write like that. But then I answered him, when I thought of writing, this is what I came up with. So I can't change it to anything else. So the reason why I did this, I wanted to understand the female's point of view, uh, what she's feeling, what she's going through. And then in the same breath, I also wanted to understand the male's point of view. You know, as a gender, we always assume that men have it easy and, you know, they, they do a lot of crazy stuff, but we actually don't take time to also understand them. 
they also have issues. So now I don't even judge men. They also have issues. They also have their problems. And that was the reason why I used both voices. Well, I think that you did that very well. And the thing is, although the two main voices we hear from are from the hero and the heroine, you also bring in other characters in the first person. So I think it's quite nice that you give us the range, not just of the diversity between man and woman, but also that you get different men, just like you get different women. And I think often when we talk about black love and some of the challenges that people then come to face in black love or just in love relationships in general, we tend to generalize. And we say men are like this and women are like this. But the first thing to understand that is that there is a point of difference between the genders, how they think and how they operate. But within that point of difference, even in the category of one gender, women will be different, men will be different, we make different choices, and we're all equally responsible for those different choices. So I think that that's very useful to people who are maybe perhaps seeking um, advice and wisdom on how to deal with some of the challenges they're facing within their love relationships. An interesting aspect of your book um, and your body of work that I find very interesting is the sort of conversation you're having about culture and Christianity and some of the things that seep through culture into Christianity and are passed off as Christianity and vice versa. Um, and you don't shy away from that, being a person of faith yourself. Tell me a little bit more about why you chose to even explore that and to bring that to the fore in your stories. Okay. Um, firstly, uh, I find that you find that the modern Christianity, that's what I call it, there's a lot of hypocrisy going on around that. You know, people act one way, but they don't say what they do or vice versa. So I was just trying to actually expose that aspect to say, you know, as, as Christians, we need to be accountable for, for what we are. And then also for people to understand that it doesn't matter if you're a Christian or not. We all make mistakes regardless. We are all people. We all have issues. So you find you can see a Christian and then you assume that they shouldn't have problems. You don't even know what they're going through behind the scenes. You know, maybe they're also struggling with patrol money, but they choose to show up for whatever event. So I was just trying to do that. And then I brought in the aspect that um, the male character was from a, a, a son of a pastor. And then even the, the hairstyle, I mean, he had dreadlocks. That was also very deliberate. Uh, you find that people will judge people based on their hair, on their dressing. But I don't think we should do that. People are not their hair or their dressing. There's a lot of people going on inside. So that was very deliberate so that we can have such conversations that we're having now. And then people, if there's need to change, then they can change. And then ultimately, people can just be themselves, Christian or not. People should just be themselves. 100%. And I think it leads us into some very thought provoking questions we should all um, seek answers for for ourselves, which is, well, then what does a true Christian look like, sound like? Um, and obviously, it's in their behavior and actions and choices, but also uh, parlaying what culture and Christianity lend to the institution of marriage and how we pursue those relationships and expectations of each other into those um, uh, relationships. Now, just to take the conversation on a slightly different track, in the book, in terms of how you build the world, um, it's set in a real city, real country. Um, the many scenes and places that we love in Harare, for instance, and, and life will humble you. There is some uh, travel, so you take us you know, through to other African countries and even overseas, but mainly in Zimbabwe. And added to that contextual world building, you also reference a lot of contemporary music from the get-go all the way through. It's almost like the book has its own soundtrack why was it important for you to include that layer of storytelling in this book? Okay, I was trying to, to make it real uh, because obviously I grew up an avid reader, so I've read a lot. And so most of the books you read, uh, some of them, they're just not so real. So I was trying to target the Zimbabwean child, you know, the millennials like you were talking about, but also 
the old generation, that is me, where I come from. So even the music you find, I will put, you know, music by Brandy, which is a bit old school. Then I'll put uh, Christian music here and there. And obviously some of it is influenced by the people I, I love and respect when it comes to Christian music. So that was also very deliberate, just to make it real so that people can identify with it. People can also know that they can write their own stories and most importantly, I love my country and we have beautiful places. We've got the village. I mean, uh, to someone out there in the rural areas, they mustn't strive to go to South Africa. No, they can come to Harare and go to the village. There's a beautiful place to hang out. Yeah. So that was me just trying to be original in my own sense. Definitely original and definitely, I think, resonant with many of your Zimbabwean readers. We'll be just taking a short break there for a bit, Audrey. Powerful insights there for us all to ponder. It's time for a short break right now, but stay tuned. We'll be right back with advice from Audrey about publishing, especially because now she is doing that as one of her uh, full-time gigs. You don't want to miss this. We're back with Audrey Chirenje and we've been talking Life Will Humble You. We've been talking about her journey into this amazing career of writing and her seven books. And now we're going to take the conversation into publishing and why it's so important for women to tell their stories. So Audrey, why is it important for women like yourself and women in general all over to start telling their stories? Okay, I think um, for the longest time, uh, women have just been marginalized and once you start having this conversation, you're labeled a feminist or whatever. But you know what? We just need women to tell their stories. They're so rich with a lot of stories. Like I was explaining earlier, it only takes someone to understand a person after you've heard what they've gone through or what they actually go through on a day-to-day -day basis. So the journey into publishing for me was, like I explained, my first two books, I had a publisher. And then the third book, I actually self-published. And then while I was on that journey, I, I learned the ropes of how to go about it. And then I thought, why not? Because if you look at me and everything that I stand for, it's just different. I, I am different and I'm trying to tell people that embrace yourself, whichever way you are, and go ahead with that. So I thought, why not open a publishing house which stands for that so that people can come with their stories and know that no one's going to judge them because everyone has a voice. I remember my, my lady pastor saying to me, use your voice. And it doesn't matter if you think you're weird, you're different, you're whatnot. There's someone out there who needs to hear that story. So that's my journey. And that's why I opened this publishing company. To all those people who are labeled and whatnot, I'm here for you. Tell your story. Well, I think that that's such a great encouragement. And I don't think enough. Africans in general are telling their stories before we even get to women. So I'm glad that there are more spaces like this that are opening up and giving chances um, to those people. So how do you balance now your work, your full-time uh, work, then this new company you've started where you are in essence cultivating and creating a cultivation space for other writers and then still have time to tap into your own self to be true to your story and tell the things that you feel need to be heard and said. How do you balance such a compelling and sometimes even maybe contesting um, huge initiatives all at the same time? Plus, you're raising your beautiful girls all by yourself. Okay, thank you for that question. Let me just start by saying it's not as easy as it looks. It's actually very difficult. You've got a lot of sleepless nights, a lot of, you know, sometimes you even actually get physically sick. But uh, one thing I would like to say is I'm actually grateful for my boss right now. I'm going to mention him because I told him about my writing and my books. And even today, he actually gave me time off to be here on TV. So that's actually good. So I just think uh, to people out there, just be proud of who you are and just share and be open. And you never know, you might actually get support from that. And then in terms of uh, the, the, the publishing company, you find that it's something that I, I like. It's within my passion. Reading and writing mm. is, is my passion. So it actually doesn't even feel like work. So you find us authors, us writers, we can talk for hours, etc. And for us, it's not even work. It's something within our passion. So that's actually not a problem. Then in, with regards to family, 
I actually have a very support, uh, a very strong support structure. Family, my sisters, my sister-in-law. Sometimes I'm at a function, my one sister can go and pick up the kids and whatnot. So I'm actually grateful for, for my family, my friends, and also my church mates who actually step in and offer that support structure. Hmm. I, th I love that you've mentioned all of these different places where you're getting help, support and enabling um, of your journey and you pursuing your destiny and your career. Because I think sometimes when we celebrate strong women, we tend to create an image where it's like they're doing every little thing by themselves. And that's just an image nobody can live up to. But I think the truth is that no one is an island and we all do need help. And when we partner with the right kind of help, we do manage to do great things that go beyond us and leave a legacy for our children. Um, so from what you've learned about the process of publishing, what advice would you give budding writers? Okay, number one, first and foremost, just start. Just do it. Because I hear a lot of people saying, oh yeah, I want to write my book, but I don't know what to write about. No one can ever tell you what to write about. Write what you're passionate about. Write what you see and what you want to try and tell the world. Write about that. If it's academics, go for it. If it's social life, if it's arts, medical, just go ahead and start writing. And then number two, uh, it's not as easy as it looks. It's not as glamorous as it looks. And you find that in Zimbabwe, our reading culture is, is not as good as it should be. I think back in the day, it was actually better. And it has gone to the dogs, literally. We're competing with social media and whatnot. So you must know all these things. And then you must also be in that social media space and then appeal to the target market that you actually want to write to. And then also you need to research. A lot of research is required. You find a lot of these youngsters, they just think, oh, it's dope, it's hype, it's, and they want to be on TV. It's not as easy as it looks. You need to research, you need to do the work, you need to save those 10,000 hours they always talk about, and then ultimately just enjoy the process. That's really great advice, and I love that you've leveraged all areas of your competencies to share that with us because I think a lot of writers sometimes overlook um, the need for marketing your book, the need for um, uh, good sort of production elements to your book. Um, and then obviously I think the hard work and sweat, um, which starts by starting <laughs> and then continuing and following through. Um, you can write a bad book, but you can't edit a book that doesn't exist. Yeah. So, we love to end every session with a reading from our author and we always ask the author to pick a reading that they believe women need to hear right now. So I know that you're going to read from Life Will Humble You. Um, tell us a little bit about that reading and take us into that beautiful offering we're all waiting for. Thank you very much. So I'm going to read uh, from page uh, 12. I explained that he had thrown me out of our house and brought in a new wife who had a three-month-old baby as I had failed to conceive during the three years we had been married. I explained I had fainted at work because I was four months pregnant and I had not known as I believed I was barren. I explained how I was thrown out with only the clothes on my back and a few personal documents in broad daylight with a few neighbors looking on and some pleading with him to reconsider his actions. Tamu looked really angry. So where have you been staying? He asked. I told him I'd found a bachelor's flat in the avenues and had paid three months rent in advance with the savings I had in a secret bank account. Life had humbled me and I now had a dependent in my womb. Thank you, Audrey. It's been another great edition of the book club with our guest Audrey Chirenje profiling her books, Life Will Humble You, Chances, Appearances or Not and her most recent works. See you again next week, same time, with yet another fabulous African female author. Until then, stay safe, stay strong, and stay true. Goodbye.